My name is Margie Bannock. Hi, my name is Natty. And my husband and I um, actually started attending Westside Family when it was really in the um, beginning stages where um, a lot of people were just going to, and very excited about this place called Westside Family. Um, my mom and my uh, dad started going here at Westside a couple of years ago, and I would go every once in a while, but it wasn't until um, like a year, almost two years ago, where we started to go um, all the time. Our, in our faith, it's always an invitation and a challenge. And I think that I picked up on that right away. And I like the challenge of, of knowing that God loves us. He embraces us. Our only hope, our hope is in Jesus Christ. But that's the invitation. The challenge is then also stepping out um, in our love for Him um, to, to bring His word, His hope to other people. And I think I got that right away in my side family. For me, um, what Jesus has been doing through this church is giving me all of these different opportunities and really giving me like an arsenal of people to have to battle against like spiritual warfare and many of just life struggles that happen to any, that could happen to anyone. And I have been blessed with so many amazing people and those people in turn inspire me and they give me courage and they pray for me and in turn like I'll pray for them and it's like just this big, um, oh my goodness, what's the word, <laughs> um, like big support group and that's really what that's done for me. What does unshakable faith mean to me? That is such a deep question and that goes back to you know, so much of what we read about together in our study. We're doing Matthew. Um, so we haven't got to Hebrews yet, but I, I think that's what I really go back to is that you know, Hebrews talks about the fact that um, we have to keep our eyes fixed upon Him, the author and perfecter of our faith. And um, for me, when we keep our eyes fixed upon Him, a, a fixed point in the distance keeps you moving forward towards the goal. And um, for me, that's what Jesus does in my life. I mean, it's, He's our, our hope with our relationship with Father, God. He sent us the Holy Spirit, so we're not orphans. And, um, and that's such a beautiful place to be. Um, when we know that in our spirit, when we really know that, it's all we can do. We want to share that. We want other people to know that they're not alone. There's nothing that we can do. He'll never leave us or forsake us. Um, he's always going to be with us. So unshakable faith is just really following him. Unshakable faith leading one to generosity. Is, I think I started to go here. Is that over a lifetime when you realize everything he's done for us, there's just no way we could ever outgive God. We just can't do it. Can you thank Margie and Maddie for sharing their story with us? Yeah. We believe the faith of the next generation is worth everything. And uh, I'm so grateful for uh, many like Margie who are part of our church family who are investing in the faith of the next generation. And this is what we're going to continue to do as a church family because we believe that the generation that's coming up right now is, is so important to what God is going to be doing. They are the church that we are investing in. And so I, I thank you for um, celebrating that with me. And we believe every story, we believe your story, uh, we believe every story can be an unshakable story. And the way that it can be an unshakable story is when we put our faith in the solid rock of Jesus Christ. So no matter what you're going through, no matter how you enter today, what, what your story is outside these walls, we believe it can't be an unshakable story. And we're, we're going to challenge you, just like Maggie, uh, Margie said, that, 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 that following Jesus is not an invitation as much as it is a challenge. It's a command. And we believe that when you follow Jesus and, and, and you build your life on the solid rock of who he is, that you can have an unshakable story as well. And we want to cut, do what we can to wrap our family around you and your season of life and encourage you to follow him, trust him. And speaking of that, I want you to get out your notes. We are uh, in this series called Solid Rock. We're, we're, we're going to be finishing it up in the next couple of weeks. And next week we'll be finishing this series up. And this is the series big idea that we've been looking at. As we continue to build our, build our lives on the solid rock of Jesus, this is the series big idea. Write this in. God is generous and he wants you to excel in the grace of giving. This is a foundational truth 
that is of utmost importance for Christianity. And, and for some of you, you might have never seen this as a foundational core central truth, but it's so central, it's so important to what we know about God, and it's so important to who we are as Christ followers. As followers of Jesus, we are imitators of God's generosity. Now, God and wants you and I to excel in, in the grace of giving because this is His nature, and we are imitators of Him. However, we get caught up in a pretense. We get, we get caught up in, in, a, um, in, a, in a misunderstanding or a lie that we believe. In, and we believe this lie that says, I'll give more when I have more. You ever been there? Have you ever believed that? Or maybe um, you, you said something, hey, I'll, I'll give generously and I'll be able to give when I have more to give. Or have you ever thought this? Man, it must be nice to have the money to be able to give generously like that as, you, as you've seen somebody else give. I know I have. And if you're like me uh, and you have those thoughts, I want to challenge you because there's something that I've learned just in my own faith. And it's this right here. Abundance of wealth does not guarantee that someone will be generous. Abundance of wealth doesn't guarantee this. And we get stuck in this lie. We get stuck in this mindset or this mind trap. Uh, similar to that we talked about those mindsets last week that we get stuck in. And we get stuck in this mind trap that we need more to be generous. But more does not guarantee generosity. And having more only does something. And, and you've seen this. You, you've seen stories. You've seen this in the news. You've seen this in, 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 with, with many people. All more does is having more just magnifies or accelerates what you're doing now with your money. It, it only magnifies or accelerates what you're doing right now with what you have. It, it only does that. And, and, and Jesus... He addresses this pretense, this misunderstanding, or this lie that we believe, this mind trap, if you will. And he does this in a very unique way. He addresses this, this idea that God is generous. And he addresses that we need to do something with what he's given us. And he does this in a very challenging way. He does this as he's speaking to his disciples. He reveals a couple things. He reveals God's radical generosity. You're going to hear this in the short story that I'm about ready to read to you. And you're going to also see that Jesus sets out a principle of generosity. It's a spiritual principle that God sets and God sees. And so the story is about a manager and who, who wastes his boss's possessions. And this is what Jesus tells his disciples. So he's teaching this to his disciples. But there's some religious elite who are in earshot of this. You're going to hear how those religious elite respond to this as well. And so this is the story that he tells his disciples. There was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be manager any longer. The manager said to himself, what shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called in each, of, each one of his master's debtors. He asked the first, how much do you owe my master? 900 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it 450. Then he asked the second, and how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, take your bill and make it 800. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world, Jesus continues to teach the disciples this, the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than they are the people of the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. And then he says this, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you've not been trustworthy with someone else's property, 
Who will give you property of your own? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. The Pharisees, who loved money, heard all this and were sneering at Jesus. He said to them, You are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of others. But God knows your heart. What people value highly is detestable in God's sight. A very convicting story. I mean, I read this and, 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 and the Lord exposes my heart too in this. And that's what he does here. In this story, the rich man is God. And the unjust manager is that. He's just an unjust manager. He's not doing with the wealth that he's been given the way that God wanted him to handle this. And God, if Jesus uses this story to expose to his expose his disciples' hearts by making them evaluate what they do with what they have. And it's not that we can buy, and just for you the record, if you look at this and you look at a couple of those verses, you go, so can we buy our way into heaven? No, it's not that you can buy your way into heaven. And But Jesus is using this unjust manager, so this guy uses God's money unjustly. And, and in this, he, he uses this illustration that you should use your wealth to do good to those who may be in eternity with you. Like, the, hopefully, those that you're doing this with and you're sharing your generosity, they're going to be the ones that are sharing eternity with you. And this story illuminates that we are stewards. The main point of the story is that it illuminates that we are stewards who use what we have been given by God because it was His that He steward, He gives it to us to manage for His purpose, not ours. And a lot of times we think a lot in life, this is my money, this is my life, these are my things, and it's for whatever I want to do with it. And by the way, you can't tell me to do with what I have. And Jesus cuts straight to the chase of all of this. He illuminates that we are stewards who use our wealth for God's purposes, not ours. And Jesus also uses this story, this short story, to teach us that God wants each of us to be faithful stewards when we have little. Because when you're a faithful steward with little, God knows that he can trust you to be a faithful steward with much. See, faithful generosity is not dependent upon wealth. See, when you are faithful to generously steward the little God's given you, God will trust you to be faithful to generously steward much more. So be a faithful steward who God trusts and he can entrust with true riches because what you have now and what you have, and no matter what you have, how little or how much you have, this is not true wealth. Worldly wealth is not true wealth. It's not true riches. What God has in store for his new humanity, which we are new creations, we are made in the likeness of this new creation. We are born again. And what God has in store for the new humanity, the born again family of Christ, is so much greater than any of the wealth that we can experience here. See, this world is just a training camp for the new creation. This world is just a new, is, is honestly, is just a training camp for what God wants to give you and you already have inherited through Christ's work. The Apostle Paul understood this kingdom principle and he revealed, that, that, that's revealed all the way through Scripture that God is generous and he wants you to excel in generosity and he wants you to be faithful stewards of this. And, and the, Paul, the Apostle Paul, I believe, leverages this when he's encouraging the church in Corinth. And as we've been in this series, we've been looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and uh, 9, and, and nine, where this Corinthian church, Paul is really being a, a strong challenge them, to, to them to be generous. And, and to, not just generous, but to excel in this act of giving and this generosity. So I want you to listen to how he leverages this principle that God is generous and wants them to be faithful stewards. Listen to this. Now, he who supplies seed to the sower... And bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. 
You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. So don't get caught in the trap that you can't be generous because you don't have. Paul says God wants you to excel in generosity by learning to be generous on every occasion. On every occasion. And here's the big idea that I want us to see today out of these two verses. Okay, We're going to talk about this today. And I want you to see this. And we're going to talk about uh, some things that we can take out of this. But here's the teaching big idea that I want you to get today. God gives you everything you need to be a faithful steward who excels in generosity. God gives you everything you need to be a faithful steward who excels in generosity. What you have right now in your possession is what you need to be generous and excel in giving. This grace of giving. Now, you may not believe this. You may not uh, believe this because maybe you are living your life on the pretense that you need more to be generous. That you can't be generous. You can't be excellent in giving until you have more. Now, in these two verses, I want to give you some spiritual principles that I believe are spiritual principles that are throughout Scripture, but we see them in these verses right here. And these four spiritual principles are... Uh, that I want to reveal are, are, that are principles that you can depend upon, you can trust, you can rely on, you can anchor your faith into because of who Christ is. And it's, I'm telling you this because I want you to do what Jesus wants you to do, what Paul wants you to do, to excel in generosity, to excel in giving. The first principle is this. God is the supplier. See, God is not just a supplier. And many of us, we put God in the same category as our work, our boss, as, our, as, as the government, as, as all of these other things, or as, as even our own selves. God is a supplier along with all of us. No, 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 no. God is the supplier. God is the main point of this passage. And by the way, if I can let you in on something, God is the main point of scripture and God is the main point of life. A lot of times we become so myopic, not a lot of times, most all the time. (laughs) We are so myopic and we miss the point that life is not about me. Life is not about you. Life is about him. He is the supplier. We become, we, 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 we think that we're the main character in the story God's writing. No, 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 no. I'm not the main character. You're not the main character in the story God is writing. God is the main character. We are the supporting cast in the story he's writing. And see, when we were talking this through this past week, Caleb, uh, our student director, we were talking and, and I was telling him where I was going with the message. And he, he said, he goes, man, this is exactly what people do. Uh, th- there's a presumption people make that when someone uh, acts with the supreme confidence in a very uncertain si- situation, we see that person as the main character of the story. But it's not. And isn't that so true about ourselves? When we do something that's so big and so bold, or we see someone else do so, something so big and so bold, we think they're the main point of the story. No, 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 no. See, it's God. We are all supporting cast. It's about us reflecting God's image. It's about us supporting His mission. God is the supplier. Not me, not you. You and I are only recipients and channels through which God's generosity flows. Paul encourages the Corinthians with that truth when he tells them, and he tells them, hey, now he, which is God, who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food. Paul's reminding the Corinthians that God's the supplier of everything. He uses this agricultural term. I mean, they, they were so, um, in, in this agrarian culture, this, this culture of, uh, this farming culture, they understood this. And maybe you need to be reminded of this. That God is the supplier. In verse 10, Paul actually quotes from Isaiah 55.10. And I want to read this to you. In Isaiah 55.10, it says this, As the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering, the earth 
and making it bud and flourish so that it yields, look at this, seed for the sower and bread for the eater. He quotes the last part of this verse almost word for word in the translation that he's speaking this in, in, in the Greek people there in Corinth because he wants them to know that God supplies the seed. And just as God is the farmer, is not, is not the farmer, just like the, the God is the supplier of the seed for the farmer through the laws of nature. God supplies all of this through the laws of the ecosystems and, and the patterns that, that, that are governing this world. God is the supplier of all the things you need. And, and here's the thing. God is the supplier of all the things that give life and all the things that keep us alive. He's the supplier. The next principle is just as important as that first principle. Not as only just God the supplier. God is your supplier. He's my supplier. Again, God is the primary actor. We are not the, the main point of the story. We are supporting Cass. And you, here's the reality. See, you can think that God is the supplier, but not believe God is your supplier. Because you can believe for somebody else that God can meet their needs while in the middle of your own circumstance, in the middle of your own hardship, in the middle of your own, I can't see my way out of this, I have no clue how, there's no hope in this, that God's not my supplier. See, we must realize that God is not just the supplier, He's your personal supplier. He wants to meet all your needs. See, God cares for you, and He wants you to not just believe that He supplies for others. God wants you to know that He cares for you. And He wants to meet your needs and be the supplier of your needs. This is what verse 10 says. He, God, will also supply and increase your store of seed. Your store of seed. And will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. As Christians, who again, we are the supporting cast in the story God is writing. We are those who sow generously and we are those who reap generously. God gives the seed to us so that as we are faithful stewards of all that God's given us, we are stewards who do what is right in God's eyes with our supply, which is what righteousness is, doing what is right in God's eyes. As we do what is right in God's eyes, God will enlarge our harvest of righteousness. He will enable us to do more good and more righteous things with what he gives us. See, God will multiply our ability to do what is right with all we have when we are faithful with what we have now. This is a principle in the kingdom of God. Now, in the second half of this verse, Paul actually quotes another prophet, the prophet Hosea. In Hosea 10, 12, this is what God through the prophet Hosea would tell the people of Israel. Sow righteousness for yourselves, reap the fruit of unfailing love. And break up your unplowed ground, for it is time to seek the Lord until he comes and showers his righteousness on you. Paul is trying to communicate something really powerful to this Corinthian church. Paul's telling the Corinthians that they need, just as they meet the need in Jerusalem. You remember that a couple weeks ago we talked about in this passage why Paul is talking to them. It's because there's a need in Jer the Jerusalem church. They were under much persecution and they were under extreme poverty and so they were extremely impoverished in this. And he's telling the Corinthians that as they meet the need of the Jerusalem church, God will multiply its impact, multiply its effectiveness through their obedience. And God will then increase their own resource as they give generously. See, they're not just sowers, they're also reapers. And that's the thing with the kingdom of God. We reap and we sow. You know, a couple years ago, it's actually been several years ago, and I think I may have told you this story before, um, a time or two in different settings, maybe not on a Sunday. But uh, a couple of years ago, I... Uh, one of my kids were downstairs and they were eating their cereal. And um, one of my older, one of the, uh, the older kids um, came down 
and saw the kid eating the cereal and says, Hey, I want some of your cereal. Can I have some? And the other kid with the bowl of cereal goes, I don't have that much in my bowl. Get your own. I don't have that much to share. I mean, can't you see? And you ever have one of those um, moments that, like, it's, it's like a parenting gold moment. This gold, like, like you get the gold glove for parenting. Uh, well, I had a gold glove moment for parenting at this moment. And, uh, and, and I say this because it really wasn't because of me. God allowed me to see something, and it, it moved me so much that I remember it to this day. Um, so in this, I'm listening to this. I'm in the kitchen. I'm doing something in there. And this child's like, no, go get your own. And immediately, um, I go, and I go back. Because we don't just buy the small bags. We buy the big bags. And I, and I, looked, at, I looked at my child with the, the bowl of cereal. And, and, I, and, and I, uh, I looked at him, and... Uh, I said, hey, 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 give, share it, share it with your sibling. I'll make sure you always have some if you share. And then I said this, and this is that, that gold glove moment that is not me. This was the Holy Spirit, I believe, speaking through me so much that I went and I wrote it down after I had this moment with them in, the, in, in there, okay? I said... Don't give based on what you have in your bowl. Give based on what you know I have in the back. I mean, I appreciate that. I mean, God like totally just gave me like, and and I and I, but but isn't that so true? How much do in my life am I going through? And my generosity is based on what I have in my bowl. My generosity, my level of giving, my faithfulness is only based on what I have in my bowl and I lose sight of what he has in his bag. I lose sight of who he is and that he is a generous God who wants to meet my needs according to his riches and glory, who is abundant in his provision. This is who God is, but I only see what? The little I have. I don't know about you, but we get stuck, don't we? We get stuck in this, I can't give, and I'm only going to give based on what I have instead of believing, God, I'm going to give based on what I believe you have. Now, I'm not this smart, so God gets all the credit on this, but God uses our kids to teach us so much about his nature. And we get so stuck in this mentality that we forget God is the supplier. And God is my supplier. And the next principle is this, is God has enriched you with everything you have so that you can excel in generosity. He's equipped you and he's given you and enriched you with everything that you have so you can excel in generosity. That means you have everything you need. Everything you need is in within that you already have it to be excellent in this grace of giving. So what must we do? We're not going to be faithful only when we have more. We're going to be faithful with the little we have. We're going to be faithful stewards of all that has given us because God wants me to faithfully be excellent. Now, and he will then equip me to do this with, by giving me what I have to be excellent in my generosity now. But you have to just step out in faith because we don't see the big supply that he sees. That's what faith is, right? We trust that he has a bigger supply. So what do we do? We be, we're faithful in the little we have. And when we're faithful with the little we have, we will be faithful when we have much more. You're enriched and God wants to take your faithfulness and make you excellent in giving so that through your generosity, he can multiply what you do for his kingdom purposes. 
And this is one of the things about God's kingdom. We receive so we can give. We receive so we can give. And this is a principle in the kingdom of God. We receive so we can give. And when Jesus is equipping his disciples to be missionaries, um, missionary is just someone who carries out the mission of God. Okay, He's training his disciples to go and take this mission. And he's putting his kingdom mission in their hands. But he has to train them and equip them. He tells them this powerful principle and it turn and it took because he wants to make them kingdom risk takers and and this is what he does he, he equips them and he says i want you to go to the lost people of israel go to the lost jews and then he tells them to preach when you go preach the kingdom of god is near preach them that, that the kingdom of god get the good news of this kingdom and then he tells them to do big kingdom things like heal the sick raise the dead cleanse the leper he tells them to do these things and at the end of that, see, we get so caught up on that that we, we miss this next point that he says right here in, in, in Matthew 10, verse 8. But I don't want you to miss it, so this is the only thing I put in your notes. He says, freely you have received, freely give. This is what the new kingdom people do. Freely we have received, freely give. I love this, and I'm challenged by this. Because the reality is, is I cannot give what I haven't received. And what I received is what God is asking me to also to be freely with my life and be free to give. And to make sure that these 12 disciples understood this and learned their lesson, I want you to understand what Jesus did to them. Jesus tells them not to take any money with them. He says, don't take any money. Don't take extra shirts. Don't take, you know, just take what you have. He says, go. And, and Jesus was about to school them in the abundant provision that God has so that they could be confident to carry out the purpose of the kingdom of God so he could entrust them with the mission of God. And these were the disciples that God trained in this specific way and changed the world. You are here today because they were faithful with a little they had I can't emphasize this more and more it, they, like they because they were faithful you are here today because what they learned they freely received and they freely gave this away they freely gave what they received see God is the supplier God is not just the supplier he's your supplier and God has enriched you with everything you have so you can excel in generosity and the last thing I want to let you know about is this is when you excel in generosity people will glorify God this is not just for one. This is for all of the church. Together, we are the picture of God to the world. We are the picture of the new humanity that reflects the image of God to a world that does not know God, that there is one God. And that's why Paul would say, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. The world needs to know this. And that's why we are to excel in this. And God has given you everything you need to be a faithful steward who excels in generosity. Don't get caught in the mindset that you need more to be generous. This is what we do. And now, if, if you have been a part of our church family in the last couple of weeks, um, we, and you have your, your unshakable guide, We've been asking you to pray for people. We've been asking you to pray for those of you who need healing, who need God to work in their life. Maybe they need spiritual healing. Maybe they need physical healing. Maybe they need a, a relational healing. Maybe they need emotional healing. And I hope you've been praying for them. Because I, I, And I challenge you to keep on praying for them. You've been writing their names on the chat, that page 13 of your Unshakable Guide. And I want you to know I'm still remaining faithful to I'm praying for you as you pray for yours. And I'm praying for my own. That God will give you the opportunity to invite them somewhere. Invite them. Invite them into an opportunity. Maybe it's to invite them to maybe celebrate recovery or, or surviving the holidays this Friday night. Maybe it's to invite them to your group. Maybe it's to invite to them over to your home just to have dinner. But he wants to you to invite them. Maybe it's to invite them to the service. And I want to tell you something right now that we have coming up that you can invite them to. On, on Thanksgiving weekend, we begin a brand new series that we're entitling, He Shall Be Called. And in this series, we want people to know that they can call upon God. 
And that you can call upon a God on other people's behalves. And that, that He is the one they need. And, and we invite you to invite them to this series. Right? And you can open the app and there's an a image that you can just uh, hold that image and, and, and you, can, you can download it to your phone to share and invite someone else. And I in, encourage you to invite other people. And as we're in this unshakable season of building an unshakable faith on the solid rock, of Christ, solid rock of Christ, I encourage you to continue to seek the Lord. Continue to seek the Lord where, at, where God is asking or inviting you to a next level of surrender, a next level of generosity, or a next level in your faith where he's asking you to walk with him, trust in him. And, and asking what mindsets am I caught up in that I need to surrender to the Lord and break that mindset. How can you join Jesus in putting him first in your life and putting him first so you can build an unshakable faith and, re- and we can release God's unshakable love? And, and if you're new with us today, I, I want you to know that next Sunday is going to be a Sunday that... Um, that maybe your first time here today, next Sunday, we're going to do an incredible thing as a church family. We're going to have our commitment Sunday. And if you're new with us, I encourage you to come back and see how we as a church family respond to what we believe who God is and what God is all about. And I invite you to come back next week and and you you can just observe next Sunday if you're new with us. And, And I want you to see what God is doing because next week, we as a church family are going to respond in one of three ways. And we're going to, I want to challenge you. I want to tell you this today. How I'm going to challenge you next week. First, there are those of you that have been a part of our church family for the last year, or you've been a part of our church family since uh, we started Unshakable, or you've yet to make an Unshakable commitment, and we're going to invite you to make a commitment. Maybe you're going to make a new commitment, like you haven't made one. I want to invite you to do that. I'm going to make you. We. I'm going to invite you to join us because our goal is 100 percent of our church family engaging and building an Unshakable faith by. Putting the spiritual discipline into practice. The spiritual discipline of putting Jesus first in our finances. And we invite you to do this and and make this commitment in in whatever way that God is challenging you and leading you to do it. And we're not going to, we're just asking you to, we're not going to put anything. We just want to put it out there for you to be obedient and listen. Uh, Second thing that we're going to invite people on is for those who have already made an unshakable commitment and those who made the commitment last year with us or throughout the last year, we're going to invite those of you who feel like God is just calling you to finish strong. And we're going to ask you to make your commitment to finish strong next year, in this next year. Finish strong. And it doesn't mean that this year has been hard. For some of you, it's going to take a lot of faith just to believe that you can finish what God has asked you to do or what God led you to do in the beginning. Circumstances may have changed. We understand this uncertainty may have changed. And it may just be an, an act of faith to trust that, that you can finish strong. And then the last group of people that we're going to invite to, to join us in this commitment is those that maybe need to increase. Maybe God has increased your faith this year. Um, Maybe God has increased your resources through the year and God is asking you to invest more. And it's not to, uh, I'm not telling you this other than because it's happened in our life, in our home. Uh, Cassie got a brand new uh, full-time job within the same company, but full-time job now. He's increased our means. And so we're now in this group of people that God is, we feel challenging us to increase our and stretch a little more and increase our commitment. So maybe God is asking you to stretch and increase in your commitment. And a couple of weeks ago, we gave you a commitment card. And that commitment card is just a spiritual tool and a practical tool to help guide you. We have some available we'd love to give you if you want to look at one. You can also find this on the Unshakable Hub at unshakable.faith. Or you can see it on the Unshakable button on our app. But this is just an opportunity for you to challenge you, to put Jesus first. To trust that he's a supplier. Trust that he's your supplier. Trust that you can be generous with the little you have. And trust that through your generosity, people will be, God will be glorified. People will glorify God. And I want to, I want us to finish today and I want us to look at this verse that we read last week in 2 Corinthians 9, 8. And then I want to ask us to pray together. And and before I ask us to do this, I'm just going to be real with you for a second. I know it's very hard to pray with others. I know this is. The reason we've been doing this as a church family over the last year, it's, we started this practice in our Unshakable uh, series that we started with at the beginning of this journey last year. And the reason I challenge you to do this is because the God we believe in 
is who he says he is. Right? You are here because I believe you believe in that God. And one of the ways that we share Jesus is praying with one another. I want you to have the courage to pray with one another because you know who God is and you trust in him. I want you to have the courage to pray with other people because it's through prayer that people are encouraged, that you can be encouraged. And that's why we do this. And I want you to have the faith because that's who we believe in, God. And so I'm going to ask you to pray here in a second, but I want to read this verse that we believe, that Paul says, and God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all, time, all things at all times, having all that you need, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. So this is what I want to challenge you to pray for your friend. And I'm going to ask you to find somebody, two groups of two to four. I just want you to pray for the other person. Let them pray for you. And this is the prayer I want you to pray. Father, help my friend trust that you are the supplier for all his or her needs.